Welcome. We are This Week in Amateur Radio, North America's premier amateur radio and technology news magazine and bulletin service of the air. Here are the stories that are trending as we come to air this week. The ARRL announces an exciting new year-long contest. We will have team coverage. An emergency HF net is convened in Colombia in the wake of landslides and flooding. Radio amateurs in Spain and Argentina gain new and extended bands. The countdown is on to World Radio Communications Conference 2019, and we will tell you about some of the preparations already underway. Amateur radio volunteers continue in the New York City Marathon tradition. The brand new RAD FX Sat launch is slightly delayed, and AMSAT is asking for your patience when it does launch. And Ofcom in the United Kingdom is concerned about spectrum interference from wireless power distribution harmonics. We'll have the story. These headline stories will come to you in a moment along with this week's special features. We'll visit with Bruce Page, KK5DO, and get an update from AMSAT and what's new with all those amateur satellites in orbit, including the new one that's ready for launch. Our technology reporter, Leo Laporte, W6TWT, reminisces about radio when he was a kid and discusses what you need to know about modems and routers. Australia's own Anno Benshop, VK6FLAB, will be here to help you hear all those weak signals. We will have part one of an interview with Warren Pugh, KC9IL, who will discuss HF digital modes, including the ever-popular FT8. And our tower and antenna expert, Greg Stoddard, KC9RP, will be here to discuss how to perform a pre-winter inspection on your tower and antenna installation. All this is straight ahead, as edition number 976 of North America's premier amateur radio and technology news magazine and bulletin service, This Week in Amateur Radio, takes to the air right now. Reporting from our headquarters studio facility, Studio 2, here in beautiful downtown Albany, New York, where it's getting really cold outside, I'm George Bowen, W2XBS. And reporting from our news bureau in Syracuse, New York, I'm Chris Perrine, KB2FAF. And reporting from our news bureau just outside Albany, New York, from the Geek Cave Studios, I'm Rich Lawrence, KB2MOB. Reporting from our news bureau in Fayetteville, Arkansas, where brrrr is the word of the day, I'm Will Rogers, K5WLR. And reporting from Sydney, New York, where my VFW post is preparing to step off in parade for Veterans Day, I'm Don Hulick, K2ATJ. 30 minutes of solid amateur radio news begins now. Leading off this week's news comes word of a new and exciting operating event, which will kick off on January 1st, 2018 at 0000 UTC, New Year's Eve in U.S. time zones, when the ARRL International Grid Chase gets underway. With more details on this exciting new operating event, we go to Carla Pereira, KC1HSX, reporting from ARRL headquarters. The year-long event hopes to build on the popularity of the highly successful 2016 National Parks on the Air. The objective is to work stations in as many different Maidenhead grid squares as possible, and then upload your log data to ARRL's Logbook of the World. Logbook of the World registration is free and it costs nothing to participate. The Maidenhead grid square system divvies up the entire globe into 324 fields, each containing 100 grid squares that are 1 degree latitude by 2 degrees longitude in size. With 32,400 potential grid squares, it's not unlikely that anyone will run out of challenges, even though some grid squares are in areas that are uninhabited or difficult to access. Once you get active in the chase and start uploading your log data, each new grid square contact confirmed through Logbook of the World will count toward your monthly total. Getting started is simple. Turn on the radio and just call CQ or CQ Grid Chase or listen for others doing the same. Make a contact, exchange grid squares, log it, and move on to another. At the end of each month, your totals on the Grid Chase leaderboard will reset to zero, although the system retains these to determine top finishers in various categories at the end of the year. 
Any contact you make in 2018 can count toward your Chase score. It doesn't have to involve an exchange of grid squares. As long as the other operators also participate in Logbook of the World, you'll get credit automatically when they upload their logs. This means that contest contacts also count, as will contacts with special event stations or other on-air activity that uses Logbook of the World to confirm contacts. Some radio amateurs live in sparsely populated grid squares, and if you're in one of these, you could find yourself handling a pileup. Expeditions to hard-to-reach or rare grid squares undoubtedly will evolve. You also can travel to one of those grid squares yourself. There are no restrictions on modes or bands except 60 meters. Satellite contacts are valid for the chase as well. You'll find complete details online at www.arrl.org slash AIGC2018. I'm Carla Pereira, KC1 HSX. John Morris, G4ANB, came up with the locator system, which the VHF Working Group adopted in 1980 at a meeting in Maidenhead, England, thus the term Maidenhead Grid Square. If you don't know your grid square, David Levine, K2DSL, has an online calculator. Just enter a postal address, zip code, or a call sign, and his site will tell you the grid square for that location. For example, enter W1AW and the site will return FN31PR. For the purposes of the AWRL International Grid Chase, though, just the two initial letters and the two numbers that follow are all that you need to know. Some vehicles or handheld GPS units can be set to display when you are in a particular grid square. Apps are available for smartphones or tablets, such as HamSquare for iOS devices or HamGPS for Android devices. As all contacts are uploaded to Logbook of the World, participants may use their contacts toward other AWRL awards, in addition to the overall monthly and annual grid chase recognitions. These other AWRL awards include the grid-based VHF UHF Century Club and Fred Fish Memorial Award, as well as Worked All States, WAS Triple Play, DX Century Club, and Worked All Continents. Complete details of the AWRL International Grid Chase will appear in the December 2017 issue of QST. The digital edition is available on Friday, November 10th. For more information, contact the AWRL Contest Branch. I'm Steve Ford, WB8IMY, and I'm speaking with Bart Yonke, W9JJ, the ARRL Contest Branch Manager. And Bart, coming in December, QST, the digital version of which will be uh, released today, there's a big announcement about a grid chase. Can you tell me anything about that? Yes, starting with uh, January 1st, 2018, we're introducing the ARL's International Grid Chase. This is going to be a 365-day, one-year event uh, promoting activity on all amateur bands that is excluding 60 meters where the goal is to simply make contacts and the content of your contacts will include information relevant to your location and that location information, uh, which is typically at VHF, you would see this more often, will include your four digit made in head grid square. Now, what is a grid square? So a grid square is the entire world is mapped out in latitude and longitude grids, uh, one degree north and south by two degrees east and west. The size of those vary depending on where you are on the circumference of the Earth. So the further north you get, the closer together the grid squares get. Areas like Europe uh, have a lot of activity in a small area, so their grids are very populated. Whereas you can go to other countries or parts of the U.S. where the grids are more in rural areas and there's less activity. Here in Connecticut, we are in Fox November 3-1, FN 3-1. Sometimes you'll hear, especially in VHF contests, people giving out six characters, FN31PR being our location here at uh, W1AW, but we're only looking for those first four characters. So the objective is to work as many people as possible and collect as many grid square contacts basically as possible? Yes, and in fact, what it'll, how it'll come about is you will get on the air and you'll make contacts and many of those exchanges won't include grid squares at HF. They'll be in contests, they might be sections, they might be zones, they might be uh, like in sweepstakes, it'll be an exchange with your, uh, your precedence, uh, the year you were licensed, information like that without your grid square comma. But because this is fed by Logbook of the World and Logbook has 
in your TQSL certificate, your grid location, that all back feeds the uh, ARL's award program. Excellent. So January 1, 2018 is when it all starts. It does. Get on the air, make contacts, populate Logbook of the World, and participate in this activity. We'll have a web page set up, and each 30 days there will be an evaluation of how uh, people are doing around the world, and then an annual evaluation. Excellent. Thank you, Bart. You're welcome. We are This Week in Amateur Radio, your amateur radio and technology news magazine of the air. The Citizen Tribune newspaper in Tennessee recently reported that a newly reopened Radio Shack store in Jefferson City has partnered with the Lakeway Amateur Radio Club to offer licensing classes. Manager Reed Frears also created a new addition to the store, which he has described as the maker's space, the newspaper said. This open area of the store will be home to classes in such subjects as soldering, using drones, setting up a Facebook page, and configuring and using a smartphone. These types of programs were dropped by Radio Shack years ago, Frears told the newspaper. Now we have the opportunity to bring them back. We have to get to the next generation. Radio Shack will die out if we don't get to them. The bankrupt Radio Shack has closed its company-owned retail outlets. Freer's store was among the last to go dark. He was given the opportunity to reopen as a franchise store, however, and he purchases his stock from a Radio Shack distribution center. On a personal note, I wish him all the best of luck as I have fond memories of buying my first amateur radio from my local Radio Shack. Radio amateurs in Colombia have been put on an orange alert and an HF net activated on 7.117 MHz in the wake of an avalanche of mud and rocks November 8th on the La Playa River on the town of Corinto. The incident at dusk has caused between 26 and 30 injuries in the resulting flood of water and debris in the small town some 60 kilometers southeast of Cali. The emergency network of radio amateurs in Cali and Popayan are working together at this time to keep the risk management authorities informed about injured and missing people and temporary shelters, said Juan Manuel Yanguas, HK5AKN, Director and Coordinator of the Emergency Service at Liga de Radioaficionados de Cali. We continue monitoring and will inform about more risks. Yangua said the Corinto Hospital has been evacuated and a hospital facility has been set up in a camp in the city's principal park and the population is being evacuated to higher ground. Relief agencies have evacuated the community to the village of San Rafael. The spreading footprint of the avalanche has destroyed two homes. Four people are reported missing so far and six communities have been affected. The Colombian, the beach, Esmeralda, Carrizales Village, Pedregal, and El Tablon Village. Some 60 families, about 300 people in all, have been affected. A half dozen injured have been taken to the Coliseum, which had been activated as a shelter, and a crisis room has been installed at the Corinto Fire Department Command Center. The AWRL Executive Committee reviewed plans to implement recommendations by the Entry-Level License Committee when it met on October 14th in Hartford, Connecticut. At its July meeting, the AWRL Board of Directors called for work to go forward on a plan to pursue additional HF digital and phone privileges for technician licensees. The Executive Committee was told that New England Director and Entry-Level License Committee Chair Tom Freene, K1KI, will work with AWRL General Counsel Chris Imlay, W3KD, and International Affairs Vice President Jay Bellows, K0QB, to develop the specifics of a proposal for the FCC requesting expanded frequency and mode privileges for technicians. This will be completed in time for review by the full Board of Directors at its January meeting. Brene explained this week that enhancing the technician license would be an immediate step that can take place with little FCC impact since the question pool would not need to be changed. He pointed out, however, that this approach does not rule out longer-term consideration of a new entry-level license. The Entry-Level License Committee had recommended both steps in its July report to the board. The Executive Committee also heard a brief report on the work of the Ad Hoc Amateur Auxiliary Study Committee, which has prepared the first draft of a new training manual. The committee is awaiting feedback from the FCC on a proposed Memorandum of Understanding for the Amateur Auxiliary. The chair of the study panel, AWRL Second Vice President Brian Malchowski, 
N5ZGT told the executive committee that several topics related to in-house management of the program must still be resolved, and the committee hopes to have the revised amateur auxiliary package ready for consideration by the ARRL Board of Directors at its January meeting. The executive committee requested the Programs and Services Committee to undertake an evaluation of all ARRL membership program offerings in coordination with the Administration and Finance Committee. The action followed a recommendation from ARRL CEO Tom Gallagher, NY2RF, the Programs and Services Committee is to report back to the Executive Committee next fall. In his CEO report, Gallagher highlighted the efforts of the Force of 50, the ARRL amateur radio volunteers deployed to Puerto Rico, which he told the committee were assembled and equipped within 48 hours of the initial request from the American Red Cross for volunteers. ARRL President Rick Roderick, K5UR, who chaired the meeting, expressed pride in the league's efforts to provide hurricane relief to Puerto Rico and requested that Gallagher relay the executive committee's appreciation to the headquarters staff for its efforts to assist with hurricane relief efforts. Now with more on the ARRL executive committee meeting activity, here's Will Rogers, K5WLR. Will? Thanks, Rich. Other business covered at the latest ARRL executive committee meeting the executive committee directed the league's CEO, Tom Gallagher, NY2RF, who serves as its secretary, to call a special meeting of the ARRL Board of Directors this fall to consider recommendations from the Ethics and Elections Committee and related items. Executive Committee Member and Hudson Division Director Mike Lysenko, N2YBB, told the panel that the legislative team is continuing to work all avenues to secure passage and implementation of S-1534, the Amateur Radio Parity Act of 2017. The committee asked ARRL General Counsel Chris Imlay, W3KD, to work with ARRL Resources to develop recommendations for possible deregulation of the amateur service rules. The Technology Advisory Council in August issued a public notice inviting comments identifying FCC technical rules that may be obsolete or ripe for change in light of current communication technologies. The committee directed Imlay to prepare and file a request for an FCC declaratory ruling asking the Commission to correct discrepancies between Part 73, which regulates broadcasting, and Part 97, which governs amateur radio. Section 73.102, Paragraph 7, Subpart C, allows a broadcaster to retransmit an amateur service signal without the licensee's consent. Section 97.113, subpart B, largely prohibits any form of broadcasting and prohibits amateur stations from engaging in any activity related to program production or news gathering for broadcasting purposes except in certain emergency situations. Minutes of the October 14, 2017 meeting of the ARRL Executive Committee have been posted on the ARRL website. Spain's National Frequency Allocation Chart, released on October 27th, contains some good news for radio amateurs there. Spain has now adopted the global secondary 60-meter amateur radio allocation of 5351-5366 kilohertz, as agreed upon the Radio World Communication Conference in 2015. The Radio Club of Argentina has announced that hams in Argentina soon will have privileges in the 630 and 60-meter bands, as well as extended allocations at 160, 80, and 30 meters. The new allocations, which go into effect in 90 days, are 472 through 479 kilohertz and 5351.5 through 5366.5 kilohertz, the 60-meter band. Hams in Argentina will also be permitted to use the 1800 to 2000 kilohertz in the 160-meter band, 3500 through 4000 kilohertz in the 80 to 75 meter band and 10100 through 10150 kilohertz in the 30 meter band the same allocations available in the united states you're listening to north america's premier amateur radio and technology news magazine of the air we are this week in amateur radio distributed worldwide at twiar.net the wave of software-based digital modes over the past several years has altered the atmosphere of the HF bands. 
with a look at these new modes and their impact on the bands, we go to Carla Pereira, KC1HSX, who files this report from League Headquarters in Newington. Some suggest the popularity of modes that make it possible to contact stations neither operator can even hear has resulted in fewer CW and SSB signals on bands like 6 meters and 160 meters. Traditional modes require far more interaction and effort on the part of the operator. The newer digital modes, not so much. The recent advent of the Still Beta Quick FT8 mode, developed by Steve Frankie, K9AN, and Joe Taylor, K1JT, has brought this to a head. Some now wonder if FT8 marks the end of an era and the start of a new, more minimalist age. Joe Taylor told ARRL this week, quote, We've been as surprised as anyone about the rapid uptake of FT8 for making QSOs on the HF bands. SSB and CW are general purpose modes. They are good for rag chewing, DXing, contesting, emergency communications, or whatever. FT8 and the other modes and WSJTX are special purpose modes. They are designed for making reliable, error-free contacts using very weak signals. In particular, signals that may be too weak for the more traditional modes to be usable or even too weak to hear." Close quote. Taylor notes that the information exchanged in most FT8, JT65, and other digital mode contacts is little more than the bare minimum for what's considered to be a valid contact. In addition to call signs and signal reports, stations may exchange grid squares and acknowledgments. As Joe sees it, FT8 won't replace modes such as CW or SSB. However, he said, quote, Nevertheless, it's clear that, at least in the short term, many hams enjoy making rapid-fire minimal QSOs with other hams all over the world using modest equipment. For this purpose, FT8 shines, close quote. I'm Carla Pereira, KC1 HSX. Radio Amateurs recently commented in response to a top band reflector post in which Steve Ireland, VK6VZ, averred that because of FT8, 160 meter DXing has changed, perhaps forever, in recent weeks. Ireland says he downloaded FT8, but just couldn't bring himself to use it on the air. My heart isn't in it, he wrote. My computer will be talking to someone else's computer. And there will be no sense of either a particular person's way of sending CW or the tone of their voice. The human in radio has somehow been lost. In his blog, Stephen McDonald, VE7SL, compiled not only Ireland's posts, but some of the responses to it, although not identified by name or call sign. One commenter suggested that the game-changing aspect of FT8 is that those who typically operate CW or sideband will gravitate to FT8. The amount of activity on the FT8 frequency of any band is phenomenal, the commenter observed. A few complain that no skill is involved in making contacts using the computer-based digital mode. Another suggested that FT8 is already falling victim of its own success, with too many stations crowding around the designated FT8 frequencies. Others were more philosophical, with remarks along the lines of this one. It's allowing people to have smaller stations the opportunity to get on and use their radios and a computer to make contacts they would never have been able to make. This is great fun for ham radio. In a related lightning talk at the 2017 ARRL TAPR Digital Communications Conference earlier this year, ARRL contributing writer Ward Silver in Zero AX challenged his savvy audience to develop a keyboard to keyboard mode between FT8 and PSK31 that would support casual and competitive operating, be more interference and noise tolerant, and be usable by those with compromised stations and antennas. He also challenged his listeners to develop a smart spectrum display that would identify signals by mode so amateur radio could move away from the practice of setting aside specific frequencies for digital modes. Brian Rawlings, VE3QN, Radio Amateurs of Canada's Special Advisor, is in Geneva, Switzerland, attending preparatory meetings for the 2019 World Radio Communication Conference, or WRC19, until Friday, November 17th. The current meetings are the fourth of a series of meetings, which will continue until just before WRC 19, now scheduled to be held from October 28th to November 22nd, 2019. Preparatory meetings are usually held at the International Telecommunication Union headquarters in Geneva and are usually of two weeks in duration. This time, Brian is attending as a member of the Canadian delegation and also as an expert consultant for the International Amateur Radio Union. 
Preparatory meetings primarily prepare documents on the agenda items identified for the upcoming WRC. They are in turn preceded by meetings and the submission of documents from the participating administrations, for example, Canada through its authorized government agency, the Department of Innovation, Science and Economic Development. The RAC representative is made a member of the delegation by invitation and Brian's role is to advise on amateur issues. The principal amateur radio issue is the international authorization of the 50 to 54 megahertz band in ITU Region 1, Europe, Africa, and the Middle East. Canada has submitted a contribution to this meeting, indicating no concerns about interference to the Canadian users, who are, of course, radio amateurs since 50 to 54 megahertz is a primary allocation in Canada. Indeed, Canadian amateurs would welcome harmonization of the 6 meter band worldwide. In addition to Canada, there are amateur delegates in Geneva, this time representing their individual delegation and or the IARU, and they come from the United States, the Netherlands, the United Kingdom, Germany, Japan, Norway, Brazil, and Australia. These meetings are also debating an expansion of the frequencies, powers, and deployment of radio local area networks in the 5 gigahertz range. Canadian amateurs have a secondary allocation here in 5650 to 5925 MHz, which we already share with the primary users, principally meteorological radars and with ISM Wi-Fi. Also warranting close attention is an agenda item proposing frequencies for wireless power transfer, for example, charging cell phones and significantly larger devices, including vehicles. Frequencies under discussion lie in the range 19 to 300 kilohertz and possibly just below the 40 meter amateur radio band. Depending upon the frequencies planned and the technical characteristics, there may be significant interference issues to users of the HF and VHF spectrum. As he has done in recent meetings, Brian will be tweeting comments on amateur radio issues from the meetings using the hashtag pound RAC at ITU. You can also follow him via at RAC Tweets. Brian will also be including a report in the next issue of the Canadian Amateur Magazine at the conclusion of the meetings. More than 175 hams from all directions on the compass converged on New York City this past weekend to support communications for the 2017 New York City Marathon on Sunday, November 5th. Tata Consultancy Services is the event's primary sponsor. Along with more than 50,000 runners and an estimated crowd of some 2.5 million spectators, amateur radio volunteers were on the scene to assist in numerous communications and other race-related activities. Ham Radio and the Marathon have a relationship dating back to the 1970s when former ARRL Hudson Division Director and later First Vice President Steve Mendelson, W2ML, then WA2DHF, now a silent key, began organizing a cadre of ham radio volunteers to support race communications. In an era before cell phones and widespread deployment of digital mobile radio, Mendelssohn and his volunteers provided a major share of the communications, logistical, and organizational support for the growing event. Over the past decade and a half, as the marathon has become more and more prominent as a major international athletic gathering, dependence on amateur radio has been partially supplanted by non-volunteer paid resources. HAMS still staff all 26-mile stations along the route, along with medical facilities set up near most mile stations, as well as a large communications center in Central Park. Amateur radio operators act as course marshals, closely observing the participants, calling in for medical assistance, relaying logistical requirements, and, in general, lending a hand as needed. When a runner drops out of the race, even for a short period, HAMS alert medical resources and advise NYPD officers nearby. A downed runner may get a bottle of fluids, a package of high sugar candy, and the jacket of a ham volunteer draped over his or her shoulders to protect from a chilly shock. The task of marshalling all the ham radio resources for the New York City Marathon falls to Deb Kerr, KC2GPV, 
who succeeded Mendelssohn as Amateur Radio Communications Director for the NYC Marathon. This past weekend, she was on her game. We are This Week in Amateur Radio, your amateur radio and technology news magazine of the air. And now with the latest technology news and commentary from Petaluma, California. This Week in Amateur Radio is proud to present Leo Laporte. The time is now 2 a.m. in Bakava, Belgian Congo, the home of the Jungle Telegraph. We'd like to say hello to Ungat Unga Oomp and Mrs. Oomp and all the boys up at the transmitter. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Any way that the internet and the computing and digital technology are changing our lives, that's what we talk about right here. And boy, they are, aren't they? I used to listen to them when I was a kid. From a lot of my life, my early life, and that's probably why I got into radio, I used to uh, lie in bed late at night and listen to the radio. Did you do that? I used to listen to baseball games. I remember in 1969, I was lying in bed. In, uh, we lived in Rhode Island, and I was hearing about all the kids. I was 13. I was hearing all about the ki all the kids going up to Woodstock, how the roads were jammed. And I was thinking, I wish I were going to Woodstock. And I used to, you'd have to do it at night because uh, you, could, oh, you couldn't quite get it, but I used to tune in WOR in New York and listen to Gene Shepard late at night. Great, the great radio legend. Then later, uh, when I was in college, I would actually get up, and this is for a college kid unusual, I would get up at six in the morning, didn't have class, but I wanted to listen to Imus in the morning on uh, WNBC, and Reverend Billy Saul, Hargis, and all of the characters he used to do in that. But I think that's, you know what, now that I think about it, that's probably why I got into this business. My, uh, my mom, bless her heart, 83, has started posting pictures on Instagram. She's, I tried to get her into Snapchat. <laughs> Couldn't quite get her into Snapchat, but she got Instagram and she's been posting. And she posted a picture of me as a probably four-year-old kid. And I'm wearing, for some reason, I don't know, I guess I liked hats at the time. And I'm sitting in front of a record player holding 45s and playing records. And she said, yeah, you were doing this even when you were a baby. I always thought if, uh, if I had, were born in an era before radio, I'd probably have been a preacher. That's probably the closest thing right every sunday i see i preach every sunday but i, I preach the gospel preach of technology. technology technology put your hand on the computer so many of you so many people suffer with internet that is not good and it's not the problem now sometimes i admit absolutely could be the problem of the internet service provider and and pity the poor dsl provider because they're riding on top of two little copper wires that were designed for scratchy phone 90 years ago and the fact that they're getting any data down that pipe of any speed at all is kind of amazing but that's dsl technology but you know if you have bad wires in the house if you have bio wires outside the house all sorts of things can happen it can be horribly unreliable so of course if you have dsl you know it's hard to diagnose all you could do is rely upon the kindness of your internet service provider and hope that that internet service provider is a good ISP and will look at the wires and 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 say, oh yeah, we see where the problem lies. If it lies in your house, it gets more complicated because uh, they're not really responsible for the wires in your house. In fact, I, you may remember when you when you got phone service and you got DSL service, they may have offered you a in-house insurance plan, an in-house wiring insurance plan, so that, you know, you pay a buck a month or whatever, and they guarantee to fix the in-house wiring if there's problems, because that's a, a nightmare. And I don't know if you've ever gone outside to look at the phone block in your house and the wires coming into that, and you could see why it's amazing you're getting a megabit, let alone five or six megabits per second over that. So DSL, you know, struggles a little bit because of that distance from the office, the quality of the copper, inside and out. And then, you know, service providers vary greatly. They also vary greatly in their willingness to support it. However, if I were going to make a rule, a general rule, about where Internet service falls down, most of the time it's the router. And, and obviously this means just more than 51% of the time or whatever, 60, probably 70% of the time. It's not all cases, but the router is one of those things people just, they think of it as an appliance, they set it, they forget it, they have it for years, they pay no attention to it. And if you, But yet, if you have discovered that internet problems can go away if you reboot the router, 
By the way, if you call your internet service provider, it's the first thing they'll say. Reboot the router, unplug it, plug it back in, and if that fixes it, your router may be at fault. Sometimes seeing if there's new firmware and downloading it could fix it, but most of the time not. Most of the time it's just worn out. They do wear out. Uh, they get unreliable. They're cheap. And as I mentioned, you could, you should get a much better router in general. Most people are putting up with, suffering with a bad router more often than anything else. Of course, the internet service providers kind of exacerbate the problem because they very often will give you the router with the cable modem, often in one box, which means it's not very good to begin with. And then they charge you five bucks a month for it. They rent it back and they never update it or anything. They just wait till you complain. That's why, in general, what I recommend is, if you must, use the DSL modem provided by the provider, but not their router. Use your own. Go out and get your own better router. Get a modern router, an A, B, G, A, C router. That's your <laughs> no, it's, and This is why people don't. So the, the Wi-Fi technology is 802.11. The first one that came out was just 802.11. And then there was A. I'm oh, sorry, B. Then there was A, then there was G, and now it's AC. Those are the different standards. AC is the most modern. If you get an AC router, it'll do all the other ones. And uh, and you're going to spend more than you think. because. And by the way, I think it's worth it. You're only going to buy one of these routers every few years. And how much do you spend a month on your internet service? I mean, it, and how much of an annoyance is it when it goes out? Really annoying. You wouldn't <laughs> You wouldn't buy a water heater that only worked three hours a day you wouldn't buy you know you this is you want this isn't a utility you want it to work there are there is a whole category of newer very costly wi-fi routers that work differently than the traditional um that certainly wouldn't hurt either get a newer modem or uh, you know make sure it's that your internet service provider says it's okay and that you buy one that's on their recommended list, but often that'll help too. This new category of Wi-Fi routers do things a little differently uh, than the ASUS. Now, I'm still using, uh, I use a, I have a variety of solutions in my house because it's kind of a lab. I use the AC3200 from ASUS. It's an excellent Wi-Fi router. kind of looks like a spider. It's a uh, Three bands, it's, uh, it, you know, 2.45 and 2.5 gigabit uh, bands. Very good router, very expensive. But like I said, you get what you pay for. Even more expensive, though, is this new category. They're mesh routers. They work differently. In the past, if you had bad Wi-Fi connectivity as you get more distant from your access point, you would put an extender in, an Asus and Linksys and Netgear, and everybody sells these. But they don't. They would kind of work. They don't work great. And so, but you could you could kind of expand the footprint of your wireless access. In theory, these guys only go about 150 feet. In practice, even less because there's walls and all sorts of materials in between you and your access point, and it's sometimes hard for them to get through. So an extender will help. But I'm really starting to be interested in this new category. It's unfortunately extremely pricey. Eero was the first. E E R O. So you put a base station unit in. And then two satellite units. We I've found this to give me the best wireless footprint I've ever had. I mean, to the point where I can be halfway down the street and still on my Wi-Fi. Certainly covers my whole yard and the house and everything. But very, very pricey. There's some competitors coming. There's one that's delayed called Luma, L-U-M-A. I've also ordered that. I'll let you know when that comes out. And there's a newer uh, technology. won't be out till maybe Christmas, called the Plume. I mentioned this a couple of weeks ago, maybe last week. It's different, so I'd have to test it, but it's less expensive. These guys work by creating a mesh as opposed to extending. It's a little more complicated. They also do some smart things. For instance, one of the real issues with routers is keeping it up to date, especially for security. Another reason to get rid of your old router, it's almost certainly insecure. People, you know, people like... Uh, the hacker, the hacker group Lizard Squad uh, last Christmas used insecure routers, tens of thousands of them, to bring down the PlayStation Network and the Xbox Network uh, by just taking over people's routers. So you want a secure router. 
The Eero routers are updated constantly without any of an intervention on your part. They just they send you updates, which is the way it should be. So they're much more secure. They also claim they're going to update it to make it faster and more reliable as well. Be interesting to watch. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. We are This Week in Amateur Radio, your amateur radio and technology news magazine of the air. Available as a podcast on iTunes, Google Play, and TuneIn.com. I'm Steve Ford, WB8IMY, and this is the propagation forecast for Friday, November the 10th. We've gone eight days without a single sunspot, and the solar flux index has dipped to 68. Add the persistent solar wind, and you have pretty mediocre conditions on the HF bands, along with some occasional geomagnetic storms. This isn't to say that DX is off the radar entirely. It'll just be a little more challenging. You'll likely notice higher noise levels on the HF bands over the next several days. On VHF and UHF, tropospheric ducting is still creating band openings in California, and as we predicted last week, the openings have indeed migrated into Arizona and New Mexico. There are also some VHF, UHF band openings popping up in northern Florida and the Carolinas. Hey, guess what? I can't see the VU meter for where I am, so I'm going to have to just kind of wing it. I wanted to do a segment for this series while working on a tower, but as usual, Mother Nature changed my mind. So here we are again from the comfy confines of good old Studio B. As winter sets in where you live, we're often reminded of those nasty little chores we put off all summer up on our ham towers, and I'm no exception to this rule. I always put off for winter what could be more easily done during the summer. The fall is actually a good time for tower work. In many parts of the USA, there are predictable dry spells during the change of seasons. The slowing of grass and weeds gives us a good chance to inspect the tower base bolts, clamps, and any grounding hardware. This is also a good time for spraying a good amount of herbicide around tower bases, grounding systems, fences, guy anchors, and other tower parts. It's also a good time to look down on the ground around the base of the tower for any parts that may have broken off during the summer storms that you may have not noticed from a distance. It's a good idea to always keep the tower base area free from debris and junk, so anything falling from the tower is immediately visible. Tell the person that mows the grass to always watch for stuff on the ground. Keep it picked up and report anything he finds on the ground. A clean gravel ground cover around the tower base is in your best interest as a tower owner or tower user. So go outside tomorrow and clean up everything around the base of the tower. Make sure everyone else that works around the tower does the same thing. This is one of the best ways to notice problems before they appear on the radio waves. This is the season for a final trip up the tower for a pre-winter inspection of the antennas, feed lines, waterproofing, and of the tower hardware too. Take the basic tower work tools, antenna work tools, and coax installing, securing, and waterproofing items too. Take your time and check every clamp, every coax connection on all sides. Jiggle everything with your hand to inspect for tightness. Be careful not to grab any active antennas while doing your annual inspection. It is not uncommon for things to vibrate loose during the year, and this may be your last chance to climb for months or more. So take care of it before winter's worst weather gets here. Sometimes that last climb of the year is during light rain or wind. I'll climb during some wind, but prefer not to. Sometimes I don't have a choice. If you're a once a year climber and have never gone up in a stout wind and are easily made seasick, you may want to reconsider climbing in the wind. On an unguide, self-supporting tower in the wind, the tower sways around, which causes you to feel dizzy and wobbly. When you're on the tower, above the tree line, there are no references around you to let you know that you're moving. And since the tower and you are both swaying at the same rate, while the tower may actually be swaying several inches, it looks like you're sitting perfectly still. This optical illusion can make your head spin or feel dizzy. If you're used to it, this, there's no problem. But if you're easily made nauseated and you're only holding onto the tower with your hands, it could cost you your life if you suddenly had to vomit while climbing. So if you're the kind of person who gets motion sickness easily, you may want to avoid climbing during winds more than a gentle breeze. Just be patient and wait for better weather. Remember, tower work at any height can easily become deadly. Clear, sober minds must be in charge. Money spent on books, videos, and climbing gear is well worth the investment. 
This is Greg Stoddard, KF9MP, reporting for This Week in Amateur Radio. And now with this week's satellite update, here's Bruce Page, KK5DO. Rad FX Sat or Fox 1B will launch on November 14th, about 60 minutes after deployment or 140 minutes after launch. The satellite will start sending the initial beacon and transmitting Rad FX Sat Fox 1B safe mode and repeat this every two minutes. When the AMSAT engineering team sees nominal values from the telemetry, the satellite will be commanded from beacon mode into safe mode. If you do not hear the full ID stating safe mode, then the satellite is still in the beacon mode. It should only take the command team a few days to fully check out the health of the satellite and then the transponder will be made available. When the satellite is turned on for amateur use, the uplink frequency is 435.250 MHz with a PL tone of 67 Hz, and the downlink frequency is 145.960 MHz. Don't forget to adjust for Doppler. When you look at the little 10 cm by 10 cm by 11 cm cube, it is hard to believe that many hams put thousands of volunteer hours of their time into making the satellite. You can visit AMSAT.org for more information on this satellite and the others that are launching soon. This is Bruce Page, KK5DO. Foundations of Amateur Radio. This week I'm going to talk about a digital mode you can use with any amateur license, or even without an amateur license. You can set up your radio, hook it to a computer and the internet, and after installing some software, you can join the weak signal propagation reporters. So how do you start? What does it do and how can it help you? First of all, WSPR, pronounced whisper, is a way of encoding information and transmitting it across the spectrum. At the other end, a radio receives that signal, sends it to a computer, where a piece of software attempts to decode and then log it. This digital mode, invented by Joe, Kilo One Juliet Tango, is one of several modes that are gaining popularity across the amateur radio community because the beauty of this mode is that it's so unobtrusive that you're unlikely to actually hear it if you were to tune to a dedicated whisper frequency. If you want to find out what your station can hear, you can set yourself up as a dedicated receive-only station and report your findings to a central database, where others can share your information and learn what propagation is like at that particular point in time. Of course, it also means that you can use the same information to learn what propagation looks like in your neck of the woods, with your radio and your antenna set up. There's even an option that allows you to have your radio automatically change frequency, known as band hopping, and listen for whisper signals across the bands that you allocate. If you like, you can go to the whispernet.org website right now and do a search for my call sign, Victor Kilo 6, Foxtrot, Lima, Alpha, Bravo, and see what stations I've heard since I turned it on. Go on, have a look, I won't mind. My station is set up to do band hopping across all HF frequencies all day and night. And during the grey line, it only listens to 80 meters, 40 meters, 15 meters and 10 meters, since those are the frequencies my license allows me to transmit on, and I'm particularly interested how they work at sunrise and sunset. You might have heard me before talking about how the noise at my home is atrocious. Nothing has changed. It's still abysmal, but whisper signals are coming in and being decoded. If you want to do this, you'll need a radio. Any radio will work. A computer with a microphone socket and a way to pipe the audio from the radio into the computer. I'm using a 3.5mm male plug to 3.5mm male plug. You don't need a fancy audio interface, you're only listening. If you can connect an interface cable, your computer can also change frequency for you, but that's not needed to get started. Make sure that you turn the volume right down before you plug anything in. Connecting a headphone output directly to a microphone input can blow up the port if you're not careful, and Whisper doesn't need much in the way of volume. The software helps you get it set right, so read the manual before you start. Once you've set up your radio and your computer, you can watch the signals coming in on a waterfall display, a graphical representation of the audio and frequency that shows strong signals in red and no signal as blue. You'll find that turning up the volume too high will actually reduce the ability to hear signals. I'm keen to learn what I can hear and how many stations my simple 10 meter vertical antenna can hear across the amateur radio spectrum. 
I'd love to hear your weak signal stories and see what you can hear. As I said, it seems I'm becoming a shortwave listener after all. I'm Ono, Victor Kilo 6, Foxtrot Lima Alpha Bravo. You're listening to North America's premier amateur radio and technology news magazine of the air. We are This Week in Amateur Radio, distributed worldwide at TWIAR.net. I'm Will Rogers, K5WLR. Am radio is all about experimentation and doing new things. And if you just look at the amount of excitement that has grown around FT8, it's really been phenomenal. That's Warren Pugh, KC9IL, who has worked the world digitally using FT8, the newest craze in amateur radio digital modes. Rains Hapali, KC9RP, spoke with Warren via Skype about FT8 and the evolution of digital modes in general. PSK31 was developed, I believe, in the late 90s by Peter Martinez, a UK ham. That was probably one of the early popular digital modes. There have been other digital modes before that, but for whatever reason, PSK31 became fairly popular because it's chatty. You can do more than just name, rank, and serial number. And that took off through you know the 2000s. And I think I got on probably 1999. And that was probably the most popular. You know, there are these other modes, some of which were invented by the same guy who invented FSQ, for example, the Fast Simple QSO. But all told, there's probably a couple of dozen or so of these digital modes that are out there. And some of them have variations of speed and data rates. For example, one of them's got five or six different choices in the one mode, depending on how deep into the noise you want to try to go. Uh, but the JT modes, the first one was JT65, and that was released in 2003 by Joe Taylor, intended primarily for meteor scatter and moon bounce. He was a fan of that. So that was his first one. But actually, his software, the WSJT, uh, was not viewed to be very slick. There was actually another fellow out in California who developed a product called JT65HF that more people use. And in fact, that's what I used. So I didn't start using Joe Taylor's software till maybe five years or so ago. JT65 was the first one. And then in 2012, he released JT9, which has significantly narrower bandwidth, a little bit better sensitivity, maybe a dB or two. But it also offered longer duty cycles. For JT65 is a one minute cycle and, and in that minute, you're transmitting for about 47 seconds, and then the last 13 seconds, your computer is decoding, and then you're going to decide what are you going to do next. Am I going to answer this guy, or am I going to send the signal report? But it offered cycles from a five-minute Q-cell to up to a 30-minute cycle. So if you've got all day to make a contact, you can do that, but it can get significantly deeper into the noise. So that was probably the most popular of the Joe Taylor modes since 2012. And then this year, the release of FT8. It's not a JT, it's an FT. If you go look at the JT65 and the JT9 segments of the band, you wonder where everybody went. And they've gone to the FT8 segment. I started experimenting with FT8, uh, I think it was in July of this year when the beta release became known. Testing was going on for a number of months before that, but it leaked out that uh, this version of WSJTX was available for download. So I, along with probably hundreds or more, downloaded it, fired it up, and we were already familiar with how it worked because of the JT65 and JT9. So the learning curve was very easy. One of the principal complaints with JT9 and JT65 is with that one minute transmit and receive cycle, and since you're only exchanging basic information like call sign, grid square, signal report, 73, it can take about five minutes to complete a contact. And a lot can happen in five minutes. The bands can change, especially on the VHF bands, uh, an opening could close. So there was a kind of a groundswell for something quicker. FT8 uses a 15-second transmit and receive cycle. So you can complete a full FT8 QSO in a minute and a half. So that lends itself better to the VHF modes where the bands are changing quickly, but also to the rest of us who are a little ADD and, you know, come on, let's get this contact done with so I can move on to the next. So it speeds it up a lot, and I think that has had a lot to do with it. 
It's not quite as sensitive as JT9 and JT65, but it's close enough that it, it still works extremely well. How is it that FTA is so much faster? And, and not knowing everything that's going on under the hood, I think what Joe Taylor did was change the way the data is is being transmitted and being validated. For example, with JT9 and JT65, the transmission has to complete before the software starts to decode what was sent. My understanding is that in FT8, some of that work is being done during the transmission. So the, the time delay from when the transmission's completed and the decoded information shows up on your screen is much quicker in FT8. I believe the way he's been able to make it faster is to streamline the way the uh, decoding is going on so that several seconds, maybe up to five seconds, that was required with JT9 and JT65 had to be quicker because with FT8, the transmission is 13 and a half seconds out of the 15. So it's very quick turnaround in between transmissions. So part of it is that decoding is going on during the transmission and just improvements in the algorithm that he used. And again, not familiar with what goes on under the hood, but he was able to make it quicker. But the one thing I have noticed is the requirement for computer CPU has been greatly reduced. I have found that a, a little netbook with a 1.4 Atom processor can decode all 20 or so signals in the passband very efficiently. You know, that little laptop could not do that with JT9 and JT65. So he has reduced the processing power required to do the decode. He has given the computer a head start. And when you combine all those, it allows that decode to happen much quicker. And he's just shortened the amount of time needed. JT9, JT65 had a 47 second transmit cycle. And I gotta believe that that data was being repeated over that 47 seconds to accommodate maybe fading or band noise or, or what have you, where now it's being accomplished in a 13 second cycle. All these efficiencies that Joe put into the protocol has resulted in being able to make it four times faster. One of the real benefits of the digital modes is the fact that you can establish a contact with someone, even though the conditions may be not just marginal, but practically non-existent. That's a great point. I think one of the main draws of digital modes, certainly it's very appealing to uh, the younger hands in the hobby. As soon as you involve a computer, there's this instant magnetism. But from a practical standpoint, you can work much weaker signals. And the implications for hams who uh, don't have the ability to run big antennas and high power. Think someone who lives in a homeowners association controlled environment where you can't put up a big wire or a, a big vertical and you need to have something more stealth. That 10 to 15 dB advantage over more traditional modes can make the difference between making a contact or not. If you look at a number of signals that the software grabbed over the course of an hour. What modes could you work these people? If you were only trying to work single sideband, uh, you would only be able to get maybe 7% of those signals. Only the very strongest ones because single sideband really only works at about plus five dB signal to noise. So only 7% if you're a sideband person. If you go to something like CW, you get about half of those signals. So of all the signal activity that was there using traditional modes, half of them you wouldn't even be able to hear and you wouldn't be able to work them. Where CW works to about minus 10 dB signal to noise if you've got a really good set of ears and, and good headphones, FT8 will go minus 24 dB. So that additional 13, 14 dB, that's the equivalent half of going from 100 watts down to five. And in a lot of cases, you hear people, they're running one watt or less. And especially now with the solar cycle being what it is and the band conditions not being you know, terribly good, you still see a lot of activity in the, the JTs and FT parts of the bands where you're not hearing anything anywhere else. You can flip on 20 meters in the evening and really not hear much voice activity going on. But if you go to 14.074, there's a whole bunch of signals there it opens up the opportunity to work HF, stateside, and DX to people who have much more modest stations. 
And that concludes our first excerpt from a Skype conversation between Reigns Hapali, KC9RP, and digital devotee, Warren Pugh, KC9IL. We'll learn more about the most popular digital mode these days, FT8, next time. I'm Will Rogers, K5WLR. Wrapping up a two-day visit to Puerto Rico on Monday, FCC Chairman Ajit Pai recognized amateur radio volunteers in praising those who turned out to help the stricken Commonwealth in the wake of Hurricane Maria. For more on this story, we go to Carla Pereira, KC1HSX, reporting from League Headquarters in Newington. Pai said, quote, The worst of tragedies can also bring out the best in people. I saw that firsthand during my two days in Puerto Rico. Everyone is pitching in. The people of Puerto Rico helping their neighbors, hardworking Federal Emergency Management Agency staff, including communications personnel and emergency support function number two, the dedicated regulators of the Puerto Rico Telecommunications Regulatory Board, and the FCC's own Roberto Musenden, who has spent this past month away from his family on the mainland in order to help the island where he grew up. Additionally, amateur radio operators, broadcasters, cable operators, fixed wireless companies, wireline carriers, and mobile providers have stepped up to the plate, working overtime to connect the disconnected." Close quote. In October, the FCC granted ARRL's request to waive current amateur radio rules to permit data transmissions at a higher symbol rate than currently permitted in order to facilitate hurricane relief communications between the continental U.S. and Puerto Rico. The temporary waiver will enable the use of Pactor 3 and Pactor 4. I'm Carla Pereira, KC1HSX. I said recovering from Hurricane Maria will require an all-hands-on-deck effort and the FCC remains committed to doing everything we can to help restore communications networks as quickly as possible. He also expressed his belief that more funding will be needed in the months ahead. During his stay in Puerto Rico, Pai visited various parts of San Juan and towns along the northeastern coast. He also inspected a tower site and associated infrastructure on mountains in the El Yunque National Forest. That infrastructure serves a critical role in providing connectivity in the eastern part of Puerto Rico, particularly for the first responders. While there, he met with President Sandra Torres Lopez and associate member Alexander Fernandez Navarro of the Telecommunications Regulatory Board, attended a briefing hosted by FEMA, and attended by staff from ESF2, the Army Corps of Engineers, the National Weather Service, the Small Business Administration, and others, and with representatives from numerous communications entities, including fixed wireless providers and broadcasters. The path to recovery has met several challenges, most notably the lack of power and functional infrastructure, I said. One thing is clear, overcoming these challenges won't be easy. The epic whisper-carrying Canada C-3 voyage of the Polar Prince to commemorate Canada's 150th anniversary of Confederation celebration ended successfully on October 28th. Over the course of the 150-day expedition from Toronto, Ontario to Victoria, British Columbia via the Northwest Passage, the CG-3 EXP Whisper HF beacon was received on every continent except Antarctica, Trustee Barry Crampton, VE3BSB, told the AWRL this week. The Ultimate 3S Beacon Transmitter made 64,800 transmissions that resulted in 397,964 uploads to whispernet.org, Crampton said. The CG3 EXP Whisper Beacon, which transmitted on 40, 30, and 20 meters, provided an opportunity for the amateur radio community to follow the vessel's progress and share in the celebration. However, the end of the voyage does not mean the end of the beacon's transmissions, Crampton said. The CG3 EXP beacon will likely remain on the air as the Polar Prince returns to the east coast of Canada via the Panama Canal. The deadline for Radio Amateurs of Canada, Canada C3 Expedition Award submissions, is November 30th. The purpose of the award was to track the voyage of the Polar Prince from Toronto to Victoria and to study radio propagation in the Arctic regions of Canada. Stations listened for whisper signals from CG3 EXP and recorded the six-character Maidenhead grid square that was transmitted, as well as the location of the ship at the time of reception. 
The Whisper Beacon consists of a QRP Labs Kits U3S Beacon Transmitter. The antenna is a 30-meter resonant N-fed dipole from MyAntennas.com, sloping at 62 degrees up to the mid-mast. Earlier this year, Crampton explained that the Polar Prince did not carry a full-blown amateur radio station because of logistics, space, technical requirements, and the fact that many other groups also wanted their research projects on board. A whisper beacon was far easier to implement, he said. Also, he quipped, it doesn't eat, sleep, get seasick, or need a bunk. RAC Operating Wards Manager John Scott, VE1JS, already has emailed Canada C3 Expedition Award certificates to 40 radio amateurs in North America and Europe. The overall RAC Canada 150 Award program will continue until December 31st. To date, volunteers operating RAC Suffolk stations have logged nearly 45,000 contacts. The Yasmi Foundation Board of Directors has announced five excellence awards and one supporting grant for 2017. The Yasmi Excellent Award is presented to individuals and groups who, through their own service, creativity, effort, and dedication, have made a significant contribution to amateur radio. Their contribution may recognize technical, operating, or organizational achievement. The Yasmi Excellent Award consists of a cash grant and an individually engraved crystal globe. Receiving Yasmi Foundation Excellence Awards are Dayton Amateur Radio Association to pick up the nation's largest amateur radio event, Hamvention, on a few months' notice and move it to a completely different facility is a daunting task. That it went so smoothly was a testament to the extraordinary efforts of the 600 volunteers and event leadership. Paul Verhage, KD4STH, and Bill Brown, WB8ELK, for their leadership and continued technical innovation in amateur radio high altitude ballooning, or RHAB. While not in the traditional means of introduction, RHAB is exposing hundreds of students to amateur radio through an interest in science experimentation. Both honorees have written extensively about RHAB and have contributed material to the ARRL handbook. Nathaniel Frizzell, W2NAF, and Magda Moses, KM4EGE, for creating and leading the Ham Radio Science Citizen Investigation or HAMSI organization that sponsored the Solar Eclipse QSO party. The SEQP was the largest amateur radio experiment ever devised, and it generated the world's most extensive set of HF propagation observations during an eclipse. Beyond the SEQP, HAMSI is attracting the interest of professional, academic researchers, such as from numerous universities, the Arecibo Radio Observatory in Puerto Rico, MIT's Haystack Observatory, and the HARP facility in Alaska. The WSJT Development Team, initially the work of Joe Taylor, K1JT, the WSJT software suite is now maintained and extended by a team of developers led by Bill Somerville, G4WJS, Steve Frank, K9AN, Greg Beam, KI7MT, Michael Black, W9MDB, Edson Pereira, PY2SDR, and Nico Palermo, IV3NWV, in collaboration with Taylor. FT8, their latest digital mode, combines the extraordinary low signal-to-noise ratio performance of JT9 and JT65 with a much faster decoding and exchange process. Dale Hughes, VK1DSH, for his excellent work as chairman of the Amateur Working Group in ITUR, Working Party 5A, and as chairman of the sub-working group that addressed the allocation of a worldwide 60-meter amateur radio band during World Radio Communication Conference 2015. Receiving a supporting grant was Gary Pierce, KN4AQ, for his production and distribution of videos of interest to the amateur radio community through Ham Radio Now and YouTube. The Yasmi Foundation is a not-for-profit corporation 
organized to support scientific and educational projects related to amateur radio, including DXing and the introduction and promotion of amateur radio in developing countries. We are This Week in Amateur Radio, your amateur radio and technology news magazine of the air, available online at www.twiar.net. The launch of the Delta II vehicle carrying Rad FXSAT, Fox 1B, and other payloads has been delayed due to a faulty battery on the booster, United Launch Alliance announced on November 6th. The launch now is scheduled for no earlier than Tuesday, November 14th. Rad FXSAT is one of four CubeSats making up the NASA ELANA 14th mission, riding as secondary payloads aboard the Joint Polar Satellite System mission, which will launch from Vandenberg Air Force Base, California. Rad FXSAT is a partnership with Vanderbilt University's Institute for Space and Defense Electronics, ISDE, and hosts four payloads for the study of radiation effects on commercial off-the-shelf components. It will carry a Fox 1-style FM UV repeater with an uplink on 435.250 MHz, 67.0 Hz CTCSS, and a downlink on 145.960 MHz. Satellite and experiment telemetry will be downlinked via the DUV subaudible telemetry stream, which can be decoded using Fox Telem software. AMSAT Vice President Engineering Jerry Buxton, N0JY, said RADFXSAT Fox F1B will automatically come up in beacon mode, transmitting a beacon and voice ID every two minutes, starting about 50 minutes after deployment. He said AMSAT command stations will want to see voltage and current data to determine that the spacecraft is healthy and to conduct various tests before opening it up for general use. Telemetry should begin about 55 minutes after deployment, for the next 72 to 96 hours at least, as we look for a successful startup, watch the general health and function as the satellite begins to acclimate to space and perform the on-orbit checkout, Buxton said. Ground stations are invited to continue uploading received telemetry for the life of the satellite. Those using Fox Telem to capture telemetry are asked to check Upload to Server in the software settings and make sure that ground station parameters are provided. You can help AMSAT and everyone waiting to get on the air with Rad FXSAT tremendously by capturing Rad FXSAT telemetry, Buxton said. In the initial beacon mode, the transmitter is limited to 10 seconds on time, followed by a two minute off cycle. If we are seeing good data from user telemetry data, it is likely when it comes over the U.S. for the first good pass, we will command it from beacon mode to normal safe mode, which then puts RADFXSAT in full but still safe mode operation and transmits a full two frames of telemetry, Buxton said. Buxton call on the satellite community to be polite and patient as RADFXSAT is commissioned. The on-orbit checkout procedure is similar to Fox 1A AO85 and could be completed in as little as a few days if we have the cooperation of the users, he said. It is very important, not to mention just plain good amateur operating practice, to refrain from using the transponder uplink so we can do the on-orbit tests, including when we turn on transponder mode for testing. I can't stress enough the importance of this cooperation, not just for us, but for all users, simply having a little patience so we can conduct the tests as quickly and accurately as possible. Buxton said AMSAT would make it broadly known when the transponder is available for general use. If you hear someone on the transponder, please don't assume that it is open for general use, he said. Check the AMSAT website. Facebook, Twitter, to be sure you're not accidentally jumping in and unwittingly interfering with the commissioning process. And finally this week, amid growing concerns about the RF pollution that can be caused by wireless power transfer technology being utilized in the UK, Ofcom produced a report on the electric bus system used in Milton Keynes. 
The system is operated by the number 7 bus service being used in Milton Keynes, or MK. The electric buses have eight in total and are charged from a standard cable supply each night when in the bus depot during their normal daily service running between Bletchley Bus Station and Wolverton via the MK Central Railway Station. They park for between 10 and 15 minutes at each end of the route. During this time, they lower a vehicle-mounted induction loop over four induction pads set in the roadway. This procedure uses a wireless power transfer, or WPT system, to induce a charging current in the lowered induction loop plate. The frequency of operation of the WPT is between 15 and 20 kilohertz, and the charging is done at the rate of 120,000 watts using four 30kW plates set in the road surface. It's understood that very tight control of the alignment between the vehicle and the charging plates is required in order to reduce the level of radiated harmonics. The report notes that a section of out-of-band spectrum with a raised noise floor was observed between 4.2 and 7.7 .7 MHz. The source was not believed to be associated with the WPT, but there appears to have been no attempt to pinpoint the cause. The IARU is concerned that wireless power transfer technology can cause harmful interference to radio communications. If you missed any of today's edition of This Week in Amateur Radio on your local net or repeater, why not download us or stream us to your favorite digital device? You can do so by visiting our website at www.twiar.net, where you can find us streaming 24-7. We're also available as a podcast on iTunes, Google Play, and Stitcher. We're also powered by a host of MP3 podcast aggregators. For more information on that, visit our website. Once again, that's www.twiar.net. This Week in Amateur Radio is produced by Community Video Associates Incorporated, a New York State nonprofit corporation. If you would like to become an affiliate, submit news items, send us comments about the weekly amateur radio bulletin service, or just to support us, please get in contact with us via our Facebook page. Just log into Facebook and search for the group This Week in Amateur Radio. You can also find us on Twitter at twitter.com slash TWIAR. For program audio, archives, and the latest amateur radio news, visit our website at TWIAR.net. This Week in Amateur Radio version 2.0 is produced and distributed under a Creative Commons non-commercial share-alike license. Now, for the staff of This Week in Amateur Radio, this is Jessica Bowen, KC2VWX, saying 73 until next week.